To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 9. You could just take that back, boy. This order given by me to Cecil Jacobs was the beginning of a rather thin time for Jem and me. My fists were clenched and I was ready to let fly. Atticus had promised me he would wear me out if he ever heard of me fighting anymore. I was far too old and too big for such childish things. And the sooner I learned to hold in, the better off everybody would be. But I soon forgot. Cecil Jacobs made me forget. He had an announcement in the schoolyard the day before that Scout Finch's daddy defended black men. I denied it, but told Jem. What did he mean saying that, I asked. Nothing, Jem said. Ask Atticus, he'll tell you. Do you defend, do you defend black men, Atticus? I asked him that evening. Of course I do. Don't say that word, Scout. That's common. That's what everybody at school says. From now on, it'll be everybody less one. Well, if you don't want me to grow up talking that way, why do you send me to school? My father looked at me mild, with mildly, amusement in his eyes. Despite our compromise, my campaign to avoid school had continued in one form or another since my first day's dose of it. The beginning of last September had brought on sinking spells, dizziness, and mild gastric complaints. I went so far as to pay a nickel for the privilege of rubbing my head against the head of Miss Rachel's cook's son, who was afflicted with a tremendous ringworm, but it didn't take. But I was worrying. Uh, I was worrying another bone. Do all lawyers? Uh, do all lawyers defend Negroes, Atticus? Of course they do, Scout. Then why did Cecil say you defended black men? He made it sound like you were running a still. Atticus sighed. I'm simply defending a Negro. His name is Tom Robinson. He lives in that little settlement beyond the town dump. He's a member of Capernaum's church, and Cal knows his family well. She says they're clean-living folks. Scout, you aren't old enough to understand some things yet, but there's been some high talk around town to the effect that I shouldn't do much about defending this man. It's a peculiar case. It won't come to trial until summer session. John Taylor was kind enough to give us a postponement. If you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it? For a number of reasons, Atticus said. The main one is, if I didn't, I couldn't hold up my head in town. I couldn't represent this county in the legislature, and I couldn't even tell you or Jem not to do something again. You mean if you didn't defend that man, Jem and me wouldn't have to mind you anymore? That's about right. Why? Because I could never ask you to mind me again, Scout. Simply by the nature of the work, every lawyer gets at least one case in his lifetime that affects him personally. This one's mine, I guess. You might hear some ugly talk about it at school, but do one thing for me, if you will. You just hold your head high and keep those fists down. No matter what anybody says to you, don't let them get at your goat. Try fighting with your head for a change. It's a good one, even if it does resist learning. Atticus, are we going to win it? No, honey. Then why? Simply because we're licked a hundred years before we started is no reason for us not to try to win, said Atticus. You sound like Cousin Ike Finch, I said. Cousin Ike Finch was Macomb County's sole surviving Confederate veteran. He wore a General Hood-type beard, of which he was inordinately vain. At least once a year, Atticus Gemini called on him, and I would, ha and I would have to kiss him. It was horrible. Gemini would listen respectfully to Atticus and Cousin Ike rehash the war. Tell you, Atticus, Cousin Ike would say, the Missouri Compromise was what licked us. But if we had to go through it again... I'd walk every step of the way there, there and every step back, just like I did before. And furthermore, we'd whip them this time. Now in 1864, when Stonewall Jackson came around by, I beg your pardon, young folks. Old blue light was in heaven then. God rest his saintly brow. Come here, scout, said Atticus. I crawled onto his lap and tucked my head under his chin. He put his arms around me and rocked me gently. It's different this time, he said. This time we aren't fighting Yankees, we're fighting our friends. But remember this, no matter how bitter things get, they're still our friends, and this is still our home. With this in mind, I faced Cecil Jacobs in the schoolyard the next day. You gotta take that back, boy? You gotta make me first, he yelled. My folks said your daddy was a disgrace, and that, and that end ought to hang from the water tank. I drew a bead on him, remembered what Atticus had said, then dropped my fists and walked away. Scout's a coward, ringing in my ears. It was the first time I ever walked away from a fight. Somehow, if I fought Cecil, I would let Atticus down. 
Attica so rarely asked Jem and me to do something for him. I could take being called a coward for him. I felt extremely noble for having remembered, and remained noble for three weeks. But then Christmas came, and disaster struck. Jem and I viewed Christmas with mixed feelings. The good side was the tree and Uncle Jack Finch. Every Christmas Eve day, we met Uncle Jack at Maycomb Junction, and he would spend a week with us. A flip of the coin revealed the uncompromising uh, liniments of Aunt Alexandra and Francis. I suppose I should include Uncle Jimmy, Aunt Alexandra's husband, but as he never spoke a word to me in my life except to say get off the fence once, I never saw any reason to take notice of him. Neither did Aunt Alexandra. Long ago, in a burst of friendliness, Auntie and Uncle Jimmy produced a son named Henry, who left home as soon as was humanly possible, got married, and produced Francis. Henry and his wife deposited Francis at his grandparents every Christmas and then pursued their own pleasures. No amount of sighing could induce Atticus to let us spend Christmas Day at home. We went to Finch's Landing every Christmas in my memory. The fact that Auntie was a good cook was some compensation for being forced to spend a religious holiday with Francis Hancock. He was a year older than I, and I avoided him on principle. He enjoyed everything I disapproved of and disliked my ingenuous diversions. Aunt Alexandra was Atticus's sister, but when Jem told me about changelings and siblings, I decided that she had been swapped at birth, that my grandparents had perhaps received a Crawford instead of a Finch. Had I ever harbored the mystical notions about mountains that seem to obsess lawyers and judges, Aunt Alexandra would have been analogous to Mount Everest. Throughout my early life, she was cold and there. When Uncle Jack jumped down from the train Christmas Eve day, we had to wait for the porter to hand him two long packages. Jem and I always thought it funny when Uncle Jack pecked Atticus on the cheek. They were the only two men we ever saw kiss one another. Uncle Jack shook hands with Jem and swung me high, but not high enough. Uncle Jack was a head shorter than Atticus, the baby of the family. He was younger than Aunt Alexandra. He and Auntie looked alike, but Uncle Jack made better use of his face. We were never wary of his sharp nose and chin. He was one of the few men of science who never terrified me, probably because he never behaved like a doctor. Whenever he performed a minor service for Jem and me, as removing a splinter from a foot, he would tell us exactly what he was going to do, give us an estimation of how much it would hurt, and explain the use of any tongs he employed. One Christmas I lurked in corners, nursing a twisted splinter in my foot, permitting no one to come near me. When Uncle Jack caught me, he kept me laughing about a preacher who hated going to church so much that every day he stood at his gate in his dressing gown, smoking a hookah, and delivering five-minute sermons to any passers-by who desired spiritual comfort. I interrupted to make Uncle Jack let me know when he would pull it out, but he held up a bloody splinter in a pair of tweezers and said he yanked it while I was laughing. That was what was known as relativity. What's in those packages, I asked him, pointing to the long, thin parcels that the porter had given him. None of your business, he said. Jem said, how's Rose Almer? Rose Almer was Uncle Jack's cat. She was a beautiful yellow female. Uncle Jack said was one of the few women he could stand permanently. He reached into his coat pocket and brought out some snapshots. We admired them. She's getting fat, I said. I should think so. She, she eats all the leftover fingers and ears from the hospital. Ah, that's a damn story, I said. I beg your pardon? Atticus said, don't pay any attention to her, Jack. She's trying you out. Cal says she's been cussing fluently for a week now. Uncle Jack raised his eyebrows and said nothing. I was proceeding on, a, on the dim theory, aside from the innate attractiveness of such words, that if Atticus discovered I had picked them up at school, he wouldn't make me go. But at supper that evening, when I asked him to pass the damn ham, please, Uncle Jack pointed at me. See me afterwards, young lady, he said. When supper was over, Uncle Jack went to the living room and sat down. He slapped his eye, thighs for me to come and sit on his lap. I liked to smell him. He was like a bottle of alcohol and something pleasantly sweet. He pushed back my bangs and looked at me. You're more like Atticus than your mother, he said. You're also growing out of your pants a little. I reckon they fit all right. You like the words like damn hell now, don't you? I reckon. I said I reckon so. Well, I don't, said Uncle Jack. Not unless they're extreme... There's extreme provocation connected with them. I'll be here a week, and I don't want to hear any words like that while I'm here. Scout, you'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that. You want to grow up to be a lady, don't you? I said not particularly. Of course you do. Now let's get to the tree. We decorated the tree until bedtime, 
and that night I dreamed of the two long packages for Gem and me. The next morning, Gem and I dived for them. They were from Atticus, who had written Uncle Jack to get them for us, and they were what we had asked for. Don't point them in the house, said Atticus, when Jem aimed at a picture on the wall. You'll have to teach him to shoot, said Uncle Jack. That's your job, said Atticus. I merely bowed to the inevitable. It took Atticus's courtroom voice to drag us away from the tree. He declined to let us to take, take our air rifles to the landing. I had already begun to think of shooting Francis and said if we made one false move, he'd take them away with us, away from us for good. Pinch's landing consisted of 366 steps down a high bluff and ending at a jetty. Farther downstream, beyond the bluff, were traces of an old cotton landing where Finch Negroes had loaded bales and produce, unloaded blocks of ice, flour and sugar, farm equipment, and feminine apparel. A two-rut road ran from the riverside and vanished among dark trees. At the end of the road was a two-storied white house with porches circling it upstairs and downstairs. In his old age, our ancestor Simon Finch had built it to please his nagging wife, but with the porches, all resemblance to ordinary houses of its era ended. The internal arrangements of the Finch house were indicative of Simon's guilelessness and the absolute trust with which he regarded his offspring. There were six bedrooms upstairs, four for the eight female children, one for Welcome Finch, the sole son, and one for visiting relatives. Simple enough, but the daughter's rooms could be reached only by one staircase, Welcome's room and the, gent and the guest room only by another. The daughter's staircase was in the ground floor bedroom of their parents, so Simon always knew the hours of his daughter's nocturnal comings and goings. There was a kitchen separate from the rest of the house, tacked onto it by a wooden catwalk. In the backyard was a rusty bell on a pole, used to summon field hands or as a distress sig signal. A widow's walk was on the roof, but no widows walked there. From it, Simon oversaw his overseer watched the riverboats, and gazed into the lives of surrounding landholders. There went with the house the usual legend about the Yankees. One Finch female, recently engaged, donned her complete trousseau to save it from raiders in the neighborhood. She became stuck in the door to the daughter's staircase, but was doused with water and finally pushed through. When we arrived at the landing, Aunt Alexandra kissed Uncle Jack. Francis kissed Uncle Jack. Uncle Jimmy shook hands silently with Uncle Jack. Jem and I gave our presents to Francis, who gave us a present. Jem felt his age and gravitated to the adults, leaving me to entertain our cousin. Francis was eight and slicked back his hair. What'd you get for Christmas, I asked politely. Just what I asked for, he said. Francis had requested a pair of knee pants, a red leather book sack, five shirts, and an untied bow tie. That's nice, I lied. Jem and, I, Jem and me got air rifles, and Jem got a chemistry set, a toy one, I reckon. No, a real one. He's going to make me some invisible ink, and I'm going to write to Dylan it. Francis asked, what was the use of that? Well, you can't just see his face when he gets a letter from me with nothing in it. It'll drive him nuts. Talking to Francis gave me the sensation of settling slowly to the bottom of the ocean. He was the most boring child I ever met. As he lived in Mobile, he could not inform me on me to school authorities, but he managed to tell everything he knew to Aunt Alexandra, who in turn unburdened herself to Atticus, who either forgot it or gave me hell, whichever struck his fancy. But the only time I ever heard Atticus speak sharply to anyone was when I once heard him say, Sister, I do the best I can with them. It had something to do with my going around in overalls. Aunt Alexandra was fanatical on the subject of my attire. I could not possibly hope to be a lady if I wore breeches. When I said I could do nothing in a dress, she said I wasn't supposed to be doing things that required pants. Aunt Alexandra's vision of my deportment involved playing with small stoves, tea sets, and wearing the adipearl necklace she gave me when I was born. Furthermore, I should be a ray of sunshine in my father's lonely life. I suggested that one could be a ray of sunshine in pants just as well, but Auntie said that one had to behave like a sunbeam, that I was born good, but I had grown progressively worse every year. She hurt my feelings and set my teeth permanently on edge. But when I asked Atticus about it, he said there were already enough sunbeams in the family. And to go on about my business, he didn't mind me much the way I was. At Christmas dinner, I sat at the little table in the dining room. Jeb and Francis sat with the adults at the dining table. Auntie had continued to isolate me long after Jeb and Francis graduated to the big table. I often wondered what she thought I'd do, get up and throw something. I sometimes thought of asking her 
If she would let me sit at the big table with the rest of them just once, I would prove to her how civilized I could be. After all, I ate at home every day with no major mishaps. When I begged Atticus to use his influence, he said he had no influence. We were guests, and we sat where we were told to sit. He also said that Aunt Alexandra didn't understand girls much, much because she never had one. But her cooking made up for everything. Three kinds of meat, summer vegetables from her pantry shawls, peach pickles, two kinds of cake, and ambrosia constituted a modest Christmas dinner. Afterwards, the adults made for the living room and sat around in a dazed condition. Jem lay on the floor and I went to the backyard. Put on your coat, said Atticus dreamily, so I didn't hear him. Francis sat beside me on the back steps. That was the best yet, I said. Grandma's a wonderful cook, said Francis. She's going to teach me how. Boys don't cook, I giggled at the thought of gem in an apron. Grandma says all men should learn to cook, that men ought to be careful when with their wives and wait on them when they don't feel good, said my cousin. I don't want Dill waiting on me, I said. I'd rather wait on him. Dill? Yeah, don't say anything about it yet, but we're going to get married as soon as we're big enough. He asked me last summer. Francis hooted. What's the matter with him, I asked. Ain't, ain't anything the matter with him. You mean that little runt Grandma says stays with Miss Rachel every summer? That's exactly who I mean. I know all about him, said Francis. What about him? Grandma says he hasn't got a home. He too does. He lives in Meridian. He just gets passed around from relative to relative, and Miss Rachel keeps him every summer. Francis, that's not so, Francis grinned at me. You're mighty dumb sometimes, Jean Louise. Guess you don't know any better, though. What do you mean? If Uncle Atticus lets you run around with stray dogs, that's his own business, like Grandma says, so it ain't your fault. I guess it ain't your fault if Uncle Atticus is a uh, end lover besides but i'm only here to tell you it certainly does mortify the rest of the family francis what the hell do you mean just what i said grandma says it's bad enough he lets you all run wild but now he's turned down a nun lover we'll never be able to walk the streets of maycomb again he's ruining the family that's what that's what he's doing francis rose and sprinted down the catwalk to the old kitchen at a safe distance he called he's nothing but an end lover he is not, I roared. I don't know what you're talking about, but you better cut it out this red hot minute. I leaped off the steps and ran down the catwalk. It was easy to collar Francis. I said to take take it back, quick. Francis jerked loose and sped into the old kitchen. End lover, he yelled. When one's stalking their prey, it's best to take one's time. Say nothing, and as sure as eggs, he will become curious and emerge. Francis appeared at the kitchen door. You still mad, Jean Louise? he asked tentatively. Nothing to speak of, I said. Francis came out on the catwalk. You gonna take it back, Francis? But I was too quick on the draw. Francis shot back into the kitchen, so I retired to the steps. I could wait patiently. I sat there perhaps five minutes when I heard Aunt Alexandra speak. Where's Francis? He's out yonder in the kitchen. He knows he's not supposed to play in there. Francis came to the door and yelled, Grandma, she's got me in here and she won't let me out. What is all this, Jean Louise? I looked up at Aunt Alexandra. I haven't got him in there, Auntie. I ain't holding him. Yes, she is, shouted Francis. She won't let me out. Have you all been fussing? Jean Louise got mad at me, Grandma called Francis. Francis, come out of there. Jean Louise, if I hear another word out of you, I'll tell your father. Did I hear you say hell a while ago? No, ma'am. I thought I did. I'd better not hear it again. Aunt Alexandra was a back porch listener. The moment she was out of sight, Francis came out, head up and grinning. Don't you fool with me, he said. He jumped into the yard and kept his distance, kept kicking tufts of grass, turning around occasionally to smile at me. Jem appeared on the porch, looked at us, and went away. Francis climbed the mimosa tree, came down, put his hand in his pockets, and strolled around the yard. Ha, he said. I asked him who he thought he was. Uncle Jack? Francis said he reckoned I got told for me to just sit there and leave him alone. I ain't bothering you, I said. Francis looked at me carefully and concluded that I had been sufficiently subdued and crooned softly. And lover, this time I split my knuckle to the bone on his front teeth. My left impaired, I sailed in with my right, but not for long. Uncle Jack pinned my arms to my side and said, Stand still. Aunt Alexandra ministered to Francis, wiping his tears away with her handkerchief, rubbing his hair, patting his cheek. Atticus, Jem, and Uncle Jimmy had come to the back porch when Francis started yelling. Who started this, said Uncle Jack. Francis and I pointed at each other. Grandma, he bawled. Sh he bawled. She called me a whore lady and jumped on my uh, jumped on me. Is that true, Scout? Said Uncle Jack. I reckon so. 
When Uncle Jack looked down at me, his features were like Aunt Alexandra's. You know I told you you'd get in trouble if you used words like that. I told you, didn't I? Yes, sir, but... Well, you're in trouble now. Stay there. I was debating whether to stand there or run, and tarried in indecision for a moment too long. I turned to flee, but Jack was quicker. I found myself suddenly looking at a tiny ant struggling with a breadcrumb in the grass. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. I hate you and despise you and hope you die tomorrow, a statement that seemed to encourage Uncle Jack more than anything. I ran to Atticus for comfort, but he said I had it coming, and it was high time we went home. I climbed into the back seat of the car without saying goodbye to anyone, and at home I ran to my room and slammed the door. Jem tried to say something nice, but I wouldn't let him. When I surveyed the damage, there was only seven or eight red marks, and I was reflecting upon relativity when someone knocked on the door. I asked who it was. Uncle Jack answered. Go away. Uncle Jack said if I talked like that, he'd lick me again, so I was quiet. When he entered the room, I retreated to a corner and turned my back on him. Scout, he said, do you still hate me? Go on. Please, sir. Why, I didn't think you'd hold it against me, he said. I'm disappointed in you. You had it coming, and you know it. Didn't either. Honey, you can go, can't go around calling people. You ain't fair, I said. You ain't fair. Uncle Jack's eyebrows went up. Not fair? How not? You're real nice, Uncle Jack, and I reckon I love you, even after what you did. But you don't understand children much. Uncle Jack put his hands on his hips and looked down on me. And why do I not understand children, Miss Jean Louise? Such conduct as yours required little understanding. It was obstreperous, disorderly, and abusive. You going to give me a chance to tell you? I don't mean to sass you. I'm just trying to tell you. Uncle Jack sat, the, Jack sat down on the, be, on the bed. His eyebrows came together and he peered up at me from under them. Proceed, he said. I took a deep breath. Well, in the first place, you never stopped to give me a chance to tell you my side of it. You just lit right into me. When Jem and I fuss, Atticus doesn't ever just listen to Jem's side of it. He hears mine, too. And in the second place, you told me never to use words like that, except an extreme provocation. And France has prov 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 provocated me enough to knock his block off. Uncle Jack scratched his head. What was your side of, the side of it, Scout? Francis called Atticus something, and I wasn't about to take it off him. What did Francis call him? An end lover. I ain't very sure what it means, but the way Francis said it, tell you one thing right now, Uncle Jack. I'll I swear before God if I'll sit there and let him say something about Atticus. He called Atticus that? Yes, sir, he did, and a lot more. Said Atticus be the ruination of family, and he let Jem and me run wild. From the looks on Uncle Jack's face, I thought it, I was in for it again. When he said, we'll see about this, I knew Francis was in for it. I have a good mind to go out there tonight. Please, sir, just let it go, please. I have no intention of letting it go, he said. Ale Alexander should know about this. The idea of, wait, wait, I'll get my hands on that boy. Uncle Jack, please promise me something. Please, sir, promise you won't tell Atticus about this. He, he asked me one time not to let anything I heard about him make me mad, and I'd rather him think we were fighting about something else instead. Please promise. But I don't like Francis getting away with something like that. He didn't. You reckon you could tie up my hand? It's still bleeding some. Of course I will, baby. I know of no hand I would be more delighted to tie up. Will you come this way? Uncle Jack gallantly bowed me toward the bathroom. While he cleaned and bandaged my knuckles, he entertained me with a towel about a funny nearsighted old gentleman who had a cat named Hodge and who counted all the cracks in the sidewalk when he went to town. There now, he said, you'll have a very unladylike scar on your wedding ring finger. Thank you, Uncle Jack. Ma'am, what's a whore lady? Uncle Jack plunged into another long tale about an old prime minister who sat in the House of Commons and blew feathers in the air and tried to keep them there when all about him men were losing their heads. I guess he was trying to answer my question, but he made no sense whatsoever. Later, when I was supposed to be in bed, I went down the hall for a drink of water and heard Atticus and Uncle Jack in the living room. I shall never marry Atticus. Why, I might have children. Atticus says you have a lot to learn, Jack. I know, your daughter gave me my first lessons this afternoon. She said I didn't understand children much and told me why. She was quite right, Atticus. She told me how I should have treated her. Oh dear, I'm so sorry I romped at her. Atticus chuckled. She earned it, so don't feel too remorseful. I waited on tenterhooks for Uncle Jack to tell Atticus my side of it, but he didn't. He simply murmured, her use of bathroom invective leaves nothing to the imagination, but she doesn't know the meaning of half of what she says. She asked me what a whore lady was. <laughs> Did you tell her? No, I told her about Lady Lord Melbourne. Jack, 
When a child asks you something, answer them, for goodness sake. But don't make a production of it. Children are children, but they could spot an evasion quicker than adults. An evasion simply muddles them. No, my father mused. You had the right answer this afternoon, but the wrong reasons. Bad language is a stage all children go through, and it dies with time when they learn they're not attracting attention with it. Hot-headedness isn't. Scout's got to learn to keep her head and learn soon with what's in store for her these next few months. She's coming along, though. Jem's getting older, and she follows his example a good bit now. All she needs is assistance sometimes. Atticus, you've never laid a hand on her? I admit that. So far, I've been able to get away with my, with threats. Jack, she minds me as well as she can. She doesn't come up to scratch, to scratch half the time, but she tries. That's not the answer, said Uncle Jack. No, the answer is she knows. I know she tries. That's what makes the difference. What bothers me is that she and Jem will have to absorb some ugly things pretty soon. I'm not worried about Jem keeping his head, but Scout, she'd just as soon jump on someone as look at him if her pride's at stake. I waited for Uncle Jack to break his promise. He still didn't. Atticus, how bad is this going to be? You haven't had too much chance to discuss it. It couldn't be worse, Jack. The only thing we've got is a black man's word against the Ewells. The evidence boils down to you did, I didn't. The jury couldn't possibly be expected to take Tom Robinson's word against the Ewells. Are you acquainted with the Ewells? Uncle Jack said yes. He remembered them. He described them to Atticus, but Atticus said, You're a generation off. The present ones are the same, though. What are you going to do then? Before I'm through, I intend to jar the jury a bit. I think we'll have a reasonable chance on appeal, though. I really can't tell at this stage, Jack. You know, I'd hope to get through life without a case of this kind, but John Taylor pointed at me and said, You're it. Let this cup pass from you, man. Right. But do you think I, I could face my children otherwise? You know what's going to happen as well as I do, Jack, and I hope and pray I can get Jem and Scout through it without bitterness, and most of all, without catching Maycomb's usual disease. Why reasonable people go stark raving mad when anything involving a Negro comes up is something I pretend don't pretend to understand. I just hope that Jem and Scout come to me for their answers instead of listening to the town. I hope they trust me enough. Jean Louise? My scalp jumped. I stuck my head around the corner. Sir, go to bed. I scurried to my room and went to bed. Uncle Jack was a prince of a fellow not to let me down, but I never figured out how Atticus knew I was listening, and it was not until many years later that I realized he wanted me to hear every word he said.